This is Climate Conversations by ClimateX. Hello, I'm Kurt Newton, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Dave Damlor. Hey, Kurt. Glad to be with you today. And I think we're putting on our community activist hats today and uh, talking about how it's been going. Certainly, I see in, in the groups I'm in, people really keyed up on figuring out actions to do, taking action. You find that to be the case? Oh, absolutely. And hey, let's face it, the world's on fire. We need to be doing something pronto. I feel your urgency. Absolutely. Brother. And, yeah. you know, but there's a problem with that that I find in my gut. I want to be doing stuff so I can go to bed and feel like, yeah, I pushed the ball forward in some little bitty way. But often there's something that's missing in terms of, so who else is in the room with me? What are they coming from? What do they have to offer? You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, thinking about the people in the room, what are we doing to have fun? You know, this is urgent stuff and it can be really serious, but I think the more connected we could be with uh, the people we're working with the more effective, the more fun it can be. I think that takes us in a good place. Absolutely. I mean, I feel that way. When I'm more connected to people, I'm more likely to show up. And I think everybody benefits. So I'm more likely to take those actions and push the ball forward on multiple fronts. Yeah. So fortunately, we're hardly the only people who've had this feeling about the value of connection and how its lack can really get in the way of making progress. Right. In this episode, we're going to meet a climate advocacy group for whom the value of connection is in their DNA, a core identity. Yeah, we're going to hear about how their approach appeals to hearts, builds community, and and really energizes its members to bring about meaningful change. While fostering learning in all directions in service of its mission and vision. The people that we work with, they call themselves unsuspecting activists, right? mothers who have never done any kind of political activism or organizing, who turns out many of them have felt alone and isolated and paralyzed by the sense of overwhelm. We're talking about a group called Mothers Out Front. It's made it primarily up of mothers who want to see bold action around climate change. You just heard Vanessa Rule, who's the co-founder of Mothers Out Front and their learning and expansion director. She's been organizing for climate action initiatives for over 11 years. Yeah, we had uh, another Mothers Out Front uh, member from Cambridge, Mass., Zainab Magavi, on our podcast last season. That episode was really great and made us want to learn more. How do they do it? What's the secret? What could other groups learn from their example? Here's Vanessa again. First question was, you know, is it even possible to engage mom on this issue? And I, you know, I was telling you earlier that I didn't come to doing this work as a mother, even though my kids were three and six when I started. And because within my group of friends of mothers, it was a really unpopular topic, right? It was the downer conversation, like nobody wanted to touch that thing. And so I was not sure when Kelsey showed up. Kelsey's the other Mothers Out Front co-founder. You know, I'm a mother. The reason I'm doing this is because I think about my children and there must be other mothers out there. The question was, you know, how are people going to respond and how do we get them to, you know, step away from their incredibly busy lives to get involved? And it's proven, I mean, it feels like we've tapped into this untapped gold mine, right? And it's about giving people a viable pathway for action and then connecting them to each other. And then they learn together. So a huge part of our Learning approach is to create conditions for learning. There you have it. Connecting to each other, learning together. And this isn't just the opinion of the woman who co-founded this organization. We also talked to a newer member from San Jose, California. So my name is Stacy Deaver-Levy. I'm a mom of three boys. A friend and I started the South Bay Mothers Out Front team in November 2016 because we wanted to find a way to make a difference for our kids and help other moms be able to do the same thing. We actually had our first house party the weekend after the November 2016 election. House parties serve as the main meeting spaces for Mothers Out Front groups. We'll talk more about that in just a bit. It had been planned for a while. We didn't think it was going to go the way that it went, so we were all still in a bit of shock. But it was so encouraging to have this group of women come together and be able to talk about what can we do. It was kind of something that was building up. And then all of a sudden we realized we can do something. And 
with the Mothers Out Front model, it was really kind of easy to just plug in and start having house parties and start inviting people and form a group that would take action. So it was, it was empowering. All right, let's go back for a moment to those house parties. There's a bit more involved than drinks and snacks and relaxed conversation, yeah? Right. The house parties serve as places where Mothers Out Front groups plan, educate, and grow. They aren't about gathering with friends and neighbors just to have fun. These meetings are intentional and organized to ensure that they're doing climate action work that fits both them and their local issues. Here's Stacy again. Once everyone is gathered, we sit in a circle and give an overview of what we're gonna, going to do. There's usually one or two facilitators who facilitate the meeting. And it's a combination of education about the urgency of climate change and also conversation with what brought you here? Why does, why does this matter to you? So everyone's voice is heard in the circle. Uh, we go over not only the urgency of climate change, but also how important our voices as mothers or grandmothers is to this movement, how it's a new constituency that can't be written off as you know, kind of like left-wing crazy activists. Like we're, we're moms. We just want to protect our kids' future. Uh, we also talk about how important it is to build political will, that the technology is there. It's just a matter of building the political will and getting our voices heard. We talk about how we do that, we, usually starting on a local level and building relationships with decision makers. And we also talk about how mothers throughout the country have been effective in making their voices heard, with both with climate change and with other initiatives. I love how all of this happens by design. Facilitators are trained to guide the group together, and they're trained to pass on organizing skills that bring these mothers' important stories out into the world. It's about developing leadership in others. And, you know, I'm drawing a lot of what I'm sharing here is, is actually drawn from the work of Marshall Gans at the Harvard Kennedy School, who has looked at the best practices in organizing history and developed his own framework and, and codified it and now teaches a class. But he defines leadership as enabling others to take action in the face of uncertainty. Organizing is about making the implicit explicit. And that's what a lot of what we do in terms of learning, right? It's like all this stuff is something that um, human beings do, I think, naturally. But becoming very aware of how you use sort of those approaches explicitly and being strategic about it is what we do. Continuous learning and training, education and mentorship, all in community, are key parts of the Mothers Out Front model one that's been high value to many groups because it's easy to replicate and apply to locally meaningful climate issues, helped by people in other places that are a step or two ahead. Everything we do involves a reflective piece. Mm -hmm. So every meeting ends, every Mother's at Front meeting ends with what we call pluses, deltas, and key learnings. Mm -hmm. You know, what went well about this meeting? What would you change to make it better next time? And what's one thing you learned? And, you know, that's like every meeting all the way to a major action. So there's this constant idea that we're figuring this out together, that there isn't, you know, a tried and true path. Part of the this Mother's Up Front model that's so helpful is having a mentor and someone who can coach our team or individual members at times when they're facing something new. It's like before we met with council members, we had some support about how to do that. They actually arranged a training and they invited other teams to join it as well so that the other teams were able to benefit from that at a time when we were needing it in that moment. So there's a lot of support in getting teams to step up to the next level. A big part of how we encourage learning is through the process of coaching. And that's a scary word for some people. But there's always somebody who's we talk about coaching is, you know, being the fish out of the fishbowl. Like you don't know you're in water if you're in water. And so having that mm -hmm. sort of person asking you questions to get you to sort of you know, connect the dots is a really important part of the process. And that connects back to the leadership development. These trainings lead to a rapidly expanding crew stepping up to give powerful speeches at rallies, reach out to other local groups to build coalitions, negotiate with political and industry leaders, and create brand new chapters around the country. Yeah, I've had the pleasure to be at some of those rallies with Mothers Out Front members, and it's real. Let's dig into just how powerful and how effective these folks can be. We know what we need to do to address the climate crisis. What we don't have is political will. 
in order to do that, we need to move decision makers and we need to build political power. And the scale at which you do that is very local because it depends on people's ability to build relationships with each other, to experience agency together. So they need to be able to find things that they can actually get results on. They need to learn to organize. And that takes a lot of leadership development. It takes a lot of learning. So how do you lobby your legislature? Well, you need to be really clear. You need to have an ask. A lot of the time, they don't know anything about the issue. So, you know, shifting from these people, again, are the power holders and the experts to realizing, like, they actually need you. I mean, the number of legislators and municipal officials who have said to us, like, we've been waiting for you. Like, we've been wanting to do this, but we are not empowered to, literally. And there's no way they can know, you know, all the things they need to know to know what to do. And so, you know, we're not necessarily the experts, but it really helps for them to be able to turn, you know, during a hearing to the 100 mothers that have packed the room to say, you know, it's not me that's pushing this, it's them. The mothers made me do it. They did, right, and listen (laughs) to your mother. (laughs) What politician can be against mothers, right? Well, let's be clear. The roots of mothers out front effectiveness goes way beyond just showing up with their motherhood identity. They're engaging these would-be opponents around shared values and dialogue. They're shifting relationships from what they call a power over basis toward the more uplifting and connected power with. Maybe some listeners remember our conversation last season with Zena Magavi about their breakthrough work with natural gas utilities. That was a great example of developing power with. Three moms, Audrey, myself, and another, we walked into Eversource headquarters and sat down in a conference room with the president of Eversource Gas and two other executives. And uh, we didn't know what was going to happen at that point. (laughs) And we started by telling them, by doing the Mothers Out Front thing and telling them stories of our kids. And they had children, too. Yes. In fact, Bill Akeley told us about his kids right back. And and we bonded around that common ground that we, Mm. we, we all cared for our kids' future. Of course. And if there's something we can do and we can make it a win win. Let's, let's do it. So they agreed by the end of the we, we proposed our pilot study to research and figure out how to find those largest leaks, um, try it in Cambridge, and they said yes. And then Columbia Gas said yes, they were amazing. So we got the three largest utilities in Massachusetts to join us in this pilot study, National Grid, Columbia Gas, and Eversource Gas, mm-hmm. and that covers 95% of the gas customers. And, you know, <laughs> there are moments, actually, the guy I was speaking of, president of Eversource Gas, Long, long after, he said, you know, that first meeting, I was asked if we needed security guards and and lawyers. (laughs) And, you know, when we got to the negotiation of how to to figure out the plan for cutting the methane, once we had all the data, we did have a a sit-down discussion on our side of, like, okay, should we actually, like, get some real negotiators instead of us? And we decided, no, we'd built the relationships and we trusted in them. And... It wasn't easy, but we actually did it just between the group that had been working all along. That was two and a half years ago. And since then, stronger rules about gas leaks was one of the few bits of climate and energy legislation that the Massachusetts legislature passed at the end of their 2018 session just completed this past July. We don't know for sure, but I have to think that the campaign's persistent and productive engagement with the utilities was really part of the recipe for their success. Anyway, let's return to the concept of learning that develops leadership, empowering the unlikely activist, as Vanessa said, in us all. Modeling effective behaviors, ample encouragement, demystifying the power of expertise, all the kinds of things that support members learning by doing. We heard many stories of people learning to step up to the mic Start speaking up and speaking out. Yeah. Here, Vanessa is going to tell us about one newish member of Mothers Out Front taking an important step from simply opening her home for a house party where someone else did the talking to speaking and facilitating the conversation at the house parties herself. And guess what? It didn't end there. What we were teaching her was how to do the talking and sort of being in the front of the room. And... She said that, you know, she was terrified, but her instinct was just to say yes. And that's been her experience over and over and over again, right? That, you know, organizer would come to her and say, would you, you know, 
speak at this rally? Would you, you know, lead a team? Would you do this? And it's just, just keeps saying yes and taking those baby steps and realizing that there are other mothers who've done this and that you don't need to be an expert. All you need to do is be a mom and not that all you need to do is be a mom, but <laughs> there's a lot that comes with that. And it's just about putting one step in front of the other and just following in other people's tracks. And so she's now coaching moms in California and other parts of the country. And, you know, one of the things she says to them is just, I'm just one step ahead of you. And just that connection and that reassurance, just, you know, a lot of people just need courage. Like they, they know what to do once they believe they can do it. But it's shifting from, again, that place of of powerlessness and like other people have the answers, they're experts out there to realizing that like we're the leaders we've been waiting for. I'm just one step ahead of you. Ugh, gives me chills. That's a brilliant way to keep connected as expertise develops and uh, gets shared around. It really pulls you in. So here's Stacy's experience with learning to speak out. I really don't like public speaking at all. So for me personally, finding that courage to you know, first of all, go up there and make a couple statements a couple different times. It's definitely stretched me, but I did it and I survived and I felt really good afterwards. And then during that campaign, there was the People's Climate March in San Jose. And we had an opportunity to talk about what we were doing, our Mothers Out Front South Bay team. So Linda and I actually spoke at that at the end of the march at a rally and I was really nervous <laughs> to do that because it was a much bigger, bigger audience. And so that's another time where I feel like I pushed myself to do something that was very much out of my comfort zone. Mm. And in the end, I'm really glad that I did it. We're focusing on the local level first because it is here that we get to work face to face with other people in our own community while building relationships with our local leaders. We are asking, what can our community, our city, our county do to be part of the climate solution? That's just an example of how the Mothers Out Front model helps to stretch us and grow us. And we received so much support and encouragement to do all of those talks. When I was preparing to give my first personal statement at the city council, meeting. Vanessa worked with me one-on-one -on, -one on that and helped me find what parts of my story might be the most helpful to share. And I think she really helped me see how really making it personal was what was going to get the attention of the city council members. So I feel like she really helped me learn how to tell my story in a kind of a vulnerable way that would make me more relatable to the city council members. Whereas before that, I think I wanted to not get teary-eyed. I wanted to keep my comp keep my composure and keep it a little bit professional and at a distance. But it was making myself real to the people who are listening that was powerful. And the vote by San Jose City Council was unanimous in favor. So let's turn our attention from these local campaigns and ask, how does Mothers Out Front connect the local to the national efforts to keep growing, expanding, and evolving? You know no what? handbook that you can pull off the shelf and say, okay, now we're at step two. <laughs> I'm trying to write it, but it keeps getting rewritten. <laughs> you know, it's like, and every time we move to a new state, you know, or a new community, it's like somebody, I mean, people are bringing their resources and mm. their, their life experiences and different insights mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. enrich our approach. So it's, mm -hmm. it's constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. So one, yeah, one of the challenges is capturing those learnings and then figuring out what can you codify and, and going back to expansion and you know, replicate and what do you need to sort of honor as sort of, I think it's more like the process as opposed to the content. One of the things I love about Mothers Out Front is that we're going to scale, but in a way that truly honors local decision making and trusting that people have the resources and the knowledge that they need to get there. So, you know, the way we work is we sort of set, we, there's a goal, which is we want to transition off fossil fuels as swiftly, justly, and completely as possible. And, you know, within that, how do you get there is going to really look different based on the local conditions. I mean, one of the things that I've been doing on expansion has been to bring mothers from different states together, right, to, to talk about those stories and sort of having this vision of, oh, they did this in this place. And here, you know, that's very uh, inspiring and emboldening to, to mothers who are starting to do it somewhere else. So 
definitely, again, bringing people together and, you know, creating that cross-fertilization. You know, we have a lot of, of group meetings, you know, where team leaders come together every couple of weeks or, or once a month to, to share their stories. And when a team sort of locks into something and figures something out, it's like, what did you do there? And then other people start replicating it. And so sort of self-organizing, you know, every team is sort of an incubator and they all have different strengths. So, you know, every Mothers at Front team innovates in some way and in a way that other teams can just pick up on. I'm glad to learn here how Mothers Out Front is retaining the focus on connection and continuous learning as they expand. I bet that could be easy to lose sight of if they're not careful. How about if we bring the conversation back home, literally to the family, the parent, that most intimate of bonds? Let's acknowledge that common foundation as we hear Stacy's story. For me, when I had my first son, and he's this little, little baby. I think just like any parent, when I saw him, my heart burst and I had just way more love than I ever knew I could have for another being. And I knew I would do anything to protect him. And I still feel that way now. As he grew up, I got very involved in different, like how, how can I keep him healthy? How can I make sure he has a good education, how can I help him have a balanced life, all those different things. I spent a lot of energy as a parent looking out for my kids in those ways. And I've always cared about the, the planet and climate, but I really wasn't that active in it. It was a bit intimidating. It's kind of overwhelming, really. It just felt like way too complex of a problem. And I tried to not drive very much. I tried to make good choices in my individual life. But I wasn't, I was a little bit overwhelmed to get involved myself. And I guess as time went on, I just started getting more worried about it and realized this is a part of keeping my kids healthy. This is a part of their future. If I'm willing to spend so much time cooking them healthy food, I can make time to get active and do something. We should keep in mind with our focus this season on learning Parents are the most powerful teachers for their kids. And those kids are learning all the time, more from what we do and how we live than what we say. Do you think about um, how what you've been going through is teaching your kids important lessons? I do sometimes. I do. Honestly, there's times where it's really tricky for me to fit this into my life. And some I need to do like pull on different strings to keep me... <laughs> involved in it at times. And that's one of them is I want to model for them, you know, one, that I care about them and their future enough to do this, but two, that getting involved is not only important for me as an individual and it fills me up, but it also is a way of giving back to our future. What is it that makes mothers in particular so good at this? Love, right? And commitment. I mean, this truly is you feel it in your gut, right? And I mean, you can't go to sleep at night thinking about your children. So there's a level of commitment in that sense of, I've heard a number of mothers say to me that they got to a point where they realized that nobody else was going to fix this and that they had to do it. You know, who else is going to do it? Nobody's going to do it. And so they just have to go in there. And there's a fearlessness when you're fighting for somebody else that I think allows you to take some incredible risks. And then there's a whole there's the whole modeling. So you're, you know, this involves going out of your comfort zone to some extent, which is incredibly rewarding because you find out you can do these things and you learn and it's, it's a transformational experience. But, but what gives people the courage is the love they have for their kids. So when we take a step back and, and look at how these women have been able to accomplish so much, it seems to me that it comes down to their awesome ability to create this circle that is supportive for everyone in so many ways, where the members are connecting deeply around learning, growth, and a shared love for their children. This is really the crux of what we were talking about at the beginning of the episode. The foundation comes from these very human instincts that hold communities together. Like, don't go it alone, but bring friends. Tell your stories and come together around universally shared concerns like concern for our kids and for future generations. These may be the things we used to know but forgot. 
that foundation is the thing that can be missing in some climate action groups. The first step is to create community so they're not feeling alone and realizing that they can work together to affect change. But then there are, you know, tried and true organizing skills that, you know, social movements have drawn on for, you know, the history of time. And, yeah. you know, like knowing how to have a one-to-one -one conversation with somebody to find out what they're interested in and see sort of where your interests match and how to get them involved, learning how to tell your story, learning how to develop a strategy, mm -hmm. learning how to organize a rally. So there's a lot of learning and there's a lot of risk taking, I think, for a lot of people as they grow. And so one of the most gratifying things about this work to me is seeing people's lives transform through the work, you know, that they do together, both in terms of realizing that they don't have to figure this out alone and that there's incredible hope in working together, but also in discovering things they never thought they could do, right? The number of people who've said like, I never thought I could do public speaking. I never thought I'd, you know, go mm -hmm. and talk to my elected officials. I mm -hmm. never thought, you know, I'd be running a training uh, or, you know, building a team. And I've had members, mothers at front say to me, like, this has been like going back to college, you know, or it's opened up these pathways that I didn't even know were possible. So, Dave, you and me, two guys. Right. Hosting a climate podcast. Yep. Where we're hearing these amazing stories about how these women have uh, really kind of broken through in their organizing model. Right. And quite honestly and frankly, when I think about the groups I've been part of where they haven't really had a relationship piece and they haven't really focused on learning a community, uh-oh, mostly driven by men. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Women were not in the lead. Yeah. When I, uh, when I think about high-impact learning to change, I want to just pull – all the men that I know together and get them thinking about this. What what would it mean to to really take in some of the lessons from the Mothers Out Front model and you know apply that in our own lives and and also, you know, and equally importantly, kind of learn to back the leadership and the thinking of of these folks. I have a feeling we'll come back to this uh, as we wrap up the season. But you know, our conversations bring to mind this, this thing that I read about the climate scientist, Sarah Myrie. Back in December 2017 at an American Geophysical Union meeting, there was a panel discussion and an audience member asked this question. You show that we got to drop all the way to zero fossil fuel use within the next few decades, but I have a hard time even imagining a world without fossil fuels. Well, Sarah Myrie, who was one of the panelists, leaned over the microphone and really, really dropped it. <laughs> she says, imagine a world where women are in charge, and then you'll imagine a world without fossil fuels. There's a, an imagination that maybe we've been lacking, and perhaps from the example of Mothers Out Front, we can get, uh, we can get tapped into that imagination. So that's it for this episode of the Climate Conversations podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Please follow us. Send us your feedback on Twitter and Facebook. Check out the show notes that you'll find on the ClimateX website. And until next time, bye-bye.